I'm talk about the fixed engine, sort of one one. Uh, who I am? I'm uh, that's me, Alexander Carlson. Uh, so we're going to cover a little bit of architecture, uh, where we're coming from. Uh, we're going to talk about the engine API. We're going to talk about something called generic objects. I think that Hick has been here before, right? Yes, Henry yeah. Foster, yeah. And talked about the engine, I think. He got built with it. Yeah. <laughs> that's good. That's good. So Henry Fisher talks about the internals of the engine. So I'm going to talk about how you can use those internals now in pretty much anything. Uh, we're going to talk about like what's in the actual QBF. So if you look deep down and look at the code of the QBF file, how is it structured, how does it look, and so on and so forth. And then lastly, and this might be the uh, thing that pushes into the end, is how to test off the sales guide. Uh, if you want to grab the code samples on the URL or grab the presentation, that's the URL you can go to if you want to follow along. So, uh, just a short recap on QuickSense, just to really know what we're talking about. Um, you have sort of an engine component, you have the repository somewhere back there, it's so be other way to QRS, you have a proxy, so people are coming in up here, that could be the QuickSense client, it could be something else, uh, talks through the proxy, which in turn talks engine API with our fixed engine. You could of course bypass the proxy if you wanted to and just talk with the engine directly. So if people start looking at embedded software instead of things, uh, if you work, for example, with the Mashup API, if you work with the Extension API, or you work with the ClickSense client, you are using the Engine API. So what happens is that when we build the software, we sort of just build a layer around the Engine API. So this is how, and this is sort of, this is where all the magic happens. So what we did was that we took away some of that complexity for you. But if you want to get that complexity back and be able to do a lot of funny, funky stuff, that's when you start working with the engine API. So I know, for example, variables was something that a lot of people complained about in ClickSense when we shipped it. We always have variables. It's just that we hadn't implemented it in the UI. So there's a lot of cool features in the engine which hasn't made it into the client yet. So if you want sort of a precursor of what's going to happen in the software about six months, 12 months out, let's go look at the engine documentation. Because we ship the features first to the engine, and then in subsequent releases, we start rolling those back into the client. So uh, we just ship session apps, so on-demand apps that never persist to disk. So the agnostic engine API, what is it? Uh, it's not, I'm a little bit hesitant to call it an API, it's more of a protocol, meaning it's a JavaScript object notation remote procedure call style protocol, or JSON RPC for short. Uh, so this can run on pretty much any technology. It's not tied to a programming language. Uh, as long as you can run WebSockets, you can run the Engine API. Uh, so it's a protocol and not a language. We launched QSOCs. QuakeTech R&D is also working on something, which is called Sensei. So a lot of the examples we're going to see today are sort of client-based implementations, but you can also use this for server-to-server -server communication. So if you want to build server-side components, for example, that automate things uh, based on the engine, which was something we always used to do with repository API before, or we used the QMS API or something like that. Now we can actually automate stuff on top of the engine, which builds up some pretty cool stuff. So um, just to show you like small examples, uh, since it we mentioned, I'm just going to show it super fast. Uh, this was a product we put together just to show what the engine API could do. So for example, if you're casually browsing around on Wikipedia and you see a list of uh, films where they say the word fuck, uh, and you want to visualize that maybe, you can now sort of snap in a little component to Chrome, which is called Sensit. So if you hit that and you sort of highlight all the tables on the page, and what you can do here is you can sort of drag that in here, say that this is what we're going to do. You can hit Create App. It's going to spin for a few seconds. And what it did in the background was it created a ClickSense app, created a load script, created a data connection, loaded in all the data and then serve up the app course, and now we can start playing with it. And then we can create a bar chart or something. But there is some pretty cool uh, implications of this. This is kind of silly, but there's a lot of uh, interesting business opportunities that you can take from this, um, especially in the OEM sphere, um, which is going to see a lot more from us in the future. So that was Sensei. What we can do more is, of course, we can build real powered websites, uh, which we showed before. But this was a project we did together in the UN. So what's happening right now in the world is that the diplomatic communication is the uh, diplomatic communication of the world is moving away from press releases on embassies and so on and so forth. So you can have an official standpoint from a country, but you can also have a, a personal standpoint from a minister or from a politician 
more seen that on Twitter or on the web somewhere. So what this would do in the background essentially is that we built a web interface that's going to be publicly available in a month, maybe, that uh, we track a, a couple hundred Twitter accounts, we also crawl a few hundred uh, websites around the globe, and we pull all that information in and then give them a, essentially an interface to be able to go in and search for this. So if you would, if this would have loaded, you could have gone and said something like, yeah, I want to see everybody that talks about missiles in the Middle East. Uh, and then you would get a list of all that, and you can sort of visualize through analytics as well. You know, what's the frequency? <coughs> of, you know, are they talking about it? When are they talking about it? Can we correlate that to any more important uh, events currently in the world, and so on and so forth. So that's uh, one of it. Uh, another example, which I'm not sure if anybody's seen as well, was built by partner powers, but also uses the engine API. So there's no mashup API or stuff going on here. It's the, um, the service charge of Max. Also, being able to build very, very, very bespoke applications for customers. Uh, you can see sort of a similarity with ClickView here. here. Uh, the idea here is, of course, that you might bring in technology or sources that aren't really click related. Uh, maybe you have an ERP form that you want to fill out in conjunction with uh, analytics. So you might want to marry those two concepts together in a single place, uh, or you want to do something else. Otherwise, ClickView is a pretty good tool still. Uh, so stick with that if you want to. But this is all Engine API. There's no click shards per se. It's only the associated experience and the data coming from ClickSense. So if you want to look at a different office, maybe you want to look at Alice and Rina, maybe you want to look at the Middle East, for example, the Middle East, the East, um, and you can sort of filter down the data. What's very interesting about this when we started building all of these sites is that it's too fast. So the search, for example, on the UN, we have built in artificial one second delay because the data was coming back too fast. So that was the, uh, the first initial feedback we got from all the users is that you are too damn fast. We're not seeing an update because we're just doing it like that. Uh, so we're shifting through a couple of hundred million rows of data in a few hundred milliseconds, which is fairly, fairly, very, very impressive. So at this speed, we're currently faster than Google. Uh, so that's a little bit of what you do. And, and this is very, very raw. Like we give you nothing, essentially. We just give you the different stuff you can do. So how it could look is that you have a request which is sent from somewhere to the engine, and it's sort of JSON that you send in over the WebSocket. So you point out to a method that the server will execute. So in this case, you say something like create an object, and this is the object you want to create. And then the server will just respond with, I have now created an object, and what's the type of sheet, and I'm getting feedback. Uh, and that's the ID, for example. And then it actually also tells you exactly which other object has now changed related to this dependency which is one of the enormously big improvements we made to the Kix engine in quick sense, which is why we're also migrating that engine to quick view, is that we now don't always calculate everything. Uh, we all, all only calculate certain stuff, so uh, we can be selective on which hypercubes we want to recalculate based on selection sequence. So, demo time! So I thought we could show a few, uh, just small, silly things, uh, and these are going to be I'm going to run JavaScript in the server. Uh, this is run through something called Node.js. Uh, so it allows you to run code on the server. Let me bring this up a little bit for you. Uh, so what we do here is we have pull in QSOX, which is our engine API implementation. Uh, we just connect. We're not giving it any uh, parameters here. So we're connecting to desktop. We can, of course, connect to server if you want to. Uh, we just say connect up there. We return something we call a global handle. So now we can operate on uh, global methods. These find the documents. So if we have a global scope, for example, these are all the methods we can fire. You know, should we uh, copy apps, should we create apps, should we uh, do configure our reloads, uh, so on and so forth. So all of these methods are now available for us. So what we can do, for example, is we can say something like, just do a stupid loop and say, you know, create 50 apps, so we can run this. So now that will spin sort of in the background, and if we're happy about it, after a while it will sort of just start popping up in my desktop. There we go. So now we're going to use a of 50 apps, uh, and I pulled in my desktop implementation, but yeah. Another interesting piece of this right, is that we can start creating apps. So you can start thinking about app stores. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so maybe you can store like definitions of an app, and then you can go something like, yeah, you know, install this app on my machine. But what it's doing now is actually just taking a JSON spec that sits in the web somewhere and take that spec down to your machine, use the engine API to actually build that app on the fly. 
so right now it's connected, it's uh, building the app, actually re reloading the data for us as well. Uh, and there it is. So this is the app that we built. So here we go, we built all the charts, all that kind of fun stuff. I'm gonna demo exactly how this is done later as well. Uh, it also builds out the libraries, builds out the core charts and things like that. Uh, the very cool thing about this is the JSON spec. It's actually just a file, uh, or I already want to do with it. But it's a JSON blob. You can just take this blob and stick it in GitHub, version control it in TFS, uh, do something else with it. Uh, you can change stuff on the client zone. Uh, and that's sort of spinning up apps. Of course, you can also explore apps. This is also an obvious facility example. You know, connect to this app, get the script, and you just throw it in the console for us. So this is actually the load script for this specific app, right? Which we now can print out to a file, we can print it to somewhere else if you want it just to, I don't know, sometimes when I switch out a data source, for example, I just want to run the regex command to rename a field across 60 apps. So these are the things you can do. Uh, we're looking into if we should build tools for this or not for you guys. Uh, we already have a regex tool across all the application platforms, for example. We have exporting tools. Um, there's a partner in uh, Germany, I think, that built the Excel plugin, which, uh, yeah, they're charging for it. We built it for free, so we haven't released it yet. Uh, but that would sort of allow you to have a plugin in Excel, for example, which talks over the engine API. And you can directly have some port data to Excel and click that. And I also want to talk about generic objects. To truly understand the engine API, you need to understand generic objects. So uh, what happens really when you open an app, what we take is we take the QEF file and we read that into the engine. And the engine will serialize the entire application into a set of what we call generic objects. And these are JSON objects. Um, and all these objects are a way for us to describe an application. You know, uh, you click view, we use XML files. You use the PRD project folders. This is very, very similar. The core difference here is that we can start saving and uh, you know, storing stuff in ClickSense apps that has nothing to do with ClickSense. So in ClickSense, everything is sort of a generic object. Uh, a generic object uh, can have sort of different types, uh, and it can have any kinds of types. And, um, the engine API would recognize a few set types, the types like uh, sheet, chart, dimension, measure, and it will know what to do with those. But you can also just throw in whatever type you want to, and the engine will don't care, but will store them for you. But they don't know how to evaluate them first. Uh, so we're gonna, I'm going to come back exactly to how these looks. Uh, and they're hierarchical by nature. So uh, you can imagine maybe the, the sheet will be sort of the top level um, generic object and then all the different objects will be children to that sheet, for example. Uh, a generic object can have multiple, it can have a type, and it can also have sort of multiple hypercubes or list object definitions and so on and so forth. So before, we always we thought about the shards. So this is not a shard. So a, for example, a generic object can have six different hypercubes that powers a single visualization, for example. So a lot of times you need to build charts that needs inputs from more sets of dimensions. Maybe you have three different alternate states that you need to visualize in one set in one chart, and you just want to get all that data from the same place. Uh, so this would be the way to do it. Uh, and we have sort of dynamic properties, and all these are uh, prefixed by a queue. Uh, we're going to come back to that as well. Uh, and this is what the engine knows what to do with this. It's going to be something like a queue hypercube, and the and that hypercube will have a definition. And when the engine sees that, it knows that, oh, this is a perfect cube, I know how to evaluate this, it's going to shoot back some data to the client, and that's what I'm going to do. Uh, but you can also have full dynamic properties, which is just stuff you can save on here, which we don't have any control over. Um, so the engine doesn't know what to do with it. 